Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president, and it gives me genuine pleasure and pride to be hosting today the book launch for the new book by Professor Marcus Brunnermeyer, The Resilient Society, Lessons from the Pandemic for Recovering from the Next Major Shock. We're delighted to have Professor Brunnermeyer, a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute, launching his book with us today and to have two very distinguished and relevant discussions. Greg Ibb, Chief Economics Commentator of the Wall Street Journal, and Jillian Tech, Chair of the Editorial Board and Editor-at-Large U.S. of the Financial Times. If I can just briefly say a few words about the book, which Martin will present, Marcus will present. We're very excited because Marcus is taking his unique analytical ability to distill things to their essence, to try to tell us what we, a society needs to do with disruptive shocks that just threaten societies and threaten lives that are going to recur. It's not just the COVID pandemic. And so he wants us to think about the current framework for managing shocks it will be inadequate. It's not just about avoiding them or emphasizing measures to withstand them. Instead, Brunemeyer creates a new definition, a functional definition for building resilience by investing mechanisms that acknowledge shocks and ultimately help societies bounce back. Marcus is, in addition to obviously being at the Peterson Institute, is the Edward S. Sanford Professor in the Economics Department at Princeton University and Director of Princeton's Bentheim Center for Finance. He has won numerous prizes, is incredibly influential and published. Importantly, he's created new concepts of digital currency areas, the reversal rate in monetary economics, the paradox of prudence in broader macroeconomics, talked about systemic risk measure, COVAR, and this, with this book, he turns his analytical framework in the insights to the broader issue of societal resilience. Following Marcus's presentation, we'll have comment from Jillian Tett. As mentioned, Jillian is chair of the editorial board and editor at large in the US at the Financial Times. She writes weekly columns. Importantly for today's discussion, she is of course a trained and perhaps the most famous anthropologist in financial markets. Um, and has written a number of best-selling books based on that perspective of looking at markets and, and economies from a different lens. Um, her latest book, Anthrovision, A New Way to See Life and Business, came out in June 2021. But I also want to emphasize that her previous book, um, Fool's Gold, How Unrestrained Greed Corrupted the Dream, Shattered Global Markets and Unleashed a Catastrophe, is very much in the spirit of thinking about what actually makes systems sustainable, resilient, and not. And that's one of the reasons we wanted her with us for today's discussion. Similarly, we're delighted to have with us Greg Yip, Chief Economics Commentator for the Wall Street Journal in his weekly Capital Account column, and in real-time economics, the Wall Street Journal's economics newsletter. He was the US economics editor for The Economist based in Washington uh, from 2008 to 2015. And again, like Jillian and Marcus, he's tried to think broadly in new ways about economic systems. I particularly have in mind his previous book, Foolproof, Why Safety Can Be Dangerous and How Danger Makes Us Safe, which was published to great acclaim in 2015. So this is an exciting and I hope groundbreaking discussion, but most of all, an intellectually stimulating and useful one. And for that, I'm grateful that Marcus Brunemeyer brought us the Resilience Society. Marcus, over to you, please. Thanks a lot, Adam. It's a pleasure to be with you. And I'm very grateful to the Peterson Institute also for the feedback I got when writing this book and uh, for being able to launch the book here. And I'm also grateful for Gillian and Craig for discussing it uh, afterwards. Let me just give you a few opening remarks. Uh, as Adam mentioned, there are, we live in a, recurrent, in a world with recurrent shocks. So of course, we just went through the COVID crisis and the book is characterizing what we learn from the COVID crisis potentially for other crises we might face. We also experienced the financial crisis. We might face future financial crises. We have cyber attacks. We have natural disasters coming with uh, climate change. And the new technologies coming along uh, from geoengineering and many, many other technologies which have new uncertainties. And we have to somehow learn how to live with this crisis and what's the best with these crises and what's the best way to do with that. And on top of it, it is likely that one crisis will not come alone. It will come in pairs or triples, triplets. And then we have to figure out how to have a resilient society that we can actually bounce back after the crisis hits us. And what I want to do first is that I would like to discuss 
uh, resilience and contrast it with other concepts like you know robustness or avoiding risks or building up redundancies and just to, to see more clearly what I mean by resilience and by resilient society. The first thing is contrast resilience with robustness and what robustness is robustness is essentially you can withstand a shock. So there's a shock and it doesn't hit you at all. You just withstand it, you're very, very powerful. And you can block essentially known and unknown shocks. And the problem with uh, this robustness concept is there's always a robustness barrier. So if there's some shock which throws you over and then you can't bounce back. And it's best illustrated uh, by um, a fable by the 17th century French writer, a poet, who actually compared the oak and the reed. So the oak is very strong and very robust. All winds which come, it doesn't move at all. But if it comes a very, very strong storm, it falls and then it can't get back up. On the other hand, if you look at the reed, the reed is constantly bending left and right and is very volatile, doesn't seem very stable at all. But even after a very strong storm, it's coming back up. So it's is bouncing back all the time. And at the end of the day, the reed is not so robust, but it's more resilient because it bounces back and it seems very volatile. And La Fontaine essentially says, I bend, I bow, but I do not break. So that's essentially, the reed essentially is always coming back. And that's I think what we would like to have um, of a resilient society that you actually bounce back. It doesn't mean you constantly stand still and, and don't move, but you move potentially, it seems volatile, but you have the ability after a shock to give in, but also to bounce back. And that relates to the volatility paradox. And that's also related to Craig's work um, and his book uh, where I said, okay, when something seems very volatile, it might not mean that it's very dangerous because the reed is moving all the time. So it's very volatile, but if you have the resilience, you can come back. And of course, having small shocks might help us to learn how to live with volatility and we can bounce more easily back if you're exposed to small shocks rather than being very protected uh, from small shocks and that makes us more vulnerable. So one example is the immune system. If you live in a very sterile environment, uh, then you hit with some bacteria or some virus, you will be hit very hard. But if you live in a less sterile environment, you actually might be uh, more able to withstand some uh, sort of some shocks uh, on the health side. So that's the difference between robustness and resilience. The key here is that you give in and bounce back and you're more flexible in this regard and you don't have this robustness barrier which robustness uh, is associated with. The other aspect is to compare risk management or re avoiding risk with resilience. Risk management is very much a static concept. You want to reduce the amplitude of a shock, it's, you know, reduce the variance. While resilience is a more dynamic concept, it goes over time. You might be hit by a shock and then you give in, but then you come back. So it's in formal terms, it's about mean reversion, where you go back to the mean. And it could be the new normal, you go back to a new normal rather than uh, going back to the old mean. And if you're willing to take on some risks, but then actually the ability to bounce back allows you to take on more risk and you might have higher growth potential as well. So here, what I've plotted here is, uh, you see is that there's one process which is risky, but you have the ability to, to bounce back. So you always come with resilient. So you bounce back all the time and have on average a higher growth path in the long run. While you have another choice, the other choice is the riskless path. And along this riskless path, of course, it's less risky, but in the long run, we will be much more worse off. And that's essentially where I think we should be open to some form of risk. And we have to think carefully which risks lead to some resilient outcome we can bounce back from and which risk we can't bounce back from. And that's, I think, where the resilience destroyers or resilience killers, that's what we have to look out for in order to take on the right, uh, correct times of risk. Now, there are three levels of resilience. Uh, there is one resilience, there's a lot of psychological literature. Uh, it's about individuals. It's about, you know, training, building up human capital, building up some human capacity. If you experience some shocks to bounce back, having enough freedom, and uh, that's very, very important. 
The book talks a little bit about that, but it's primarily about the society, that the whole society as a whole is uh, resilient. So the first one is about individual resilience. The other one is about systems, how systems are resilient. And for this, you need you know, redundancies that are network, global value chains are more resilient if you have a bit, uh, more redundancies or you have buffers, capital uh, for our banks and so forth. What makes the whole concept even more interesting, I think, is if you look at the society, because then the resilience comes with interaction of people and how they respond to it. And the key is really this endogenous reaction to others' actions. So here, what I've depicted here, you can see that as a person A, it, the person A acts on something that causes negative externality, negative effects on person B. And that's actually a typical externality, external effects, which, uh, is normal, but what makes it the whole thing more tricky in this feedback here is this person B is reacting to it. So this reaction and the reaction might then cause a negative externality on person A again, which reacts again and causes a further externality and you spiral the whole thing out, out of control. So this feedback externalities are way more dangerous than just simple externalities where feedback is combined with externalities. And that's essentially what uh, we have to watch out for. And in order to control this, society has a social contract and it tries to do this with social norms. So social norms we have seen in the crisis play an important role to behave in a particular way to avoid these feedback externalities uh, and minimize the implications. So what are these resilience destroyers in essentially, and we have to watch out for risks which are associated with this resilience destroyers. Uh, one is this feedback that I just described, another one are traps. So for example, you, you've exposed, exposed to a shock, you're shocked and then you're trapped, you can't bounce back. So there's no points of no returns. Another phenomenon we really want to look out for are tipping points. Uh, when you have a certain path, so you move along the path and as, as it gets worse and worse, at some point you hit a tipping point and then it spirals out of control because these feedback effects are then kicking in. So you have to really watch out for these tipping points. And one famous example, of course, in the climate change example is, you know, if the Gulf Stream were to stop, it switches off and it won't come back on. And, but these are risks, so we have to evaluate risks differently depending what longer implications they have, whether they lead to tipping points or to some feedbacks. And we might want to manage then these feedbacks rather than the risk itself. Uh, and that's very, very important uh, in terms of policy. But more generally, what are, you know, it's just a very quick policy overview. Of course, redundancies and buffers are really important, but ideally some redeployable redundancies. You can't have redundancies for everything. That's what the robustness approach would do. You have some redundancies which you can redeploy depending on what the shock is. So you, it might take a while to employ it and then you bounce back. And you have to be very flexible, agile and have a fluid society essentially and allow for mavericks who can invent new things in your society in order to help to come back. So for example, in health, of course, that we invented these new vaccines, these mRNA vaccines, and have a new normal potentially afterwards. That's a huge plus where we bounce back. That's a very positive aspect to it. In macroeconomics and fiscal and monetary policy, we have this low interest rate and its implication, does it give you more resilience on the fiscal side? You have more, more fiscal space with a low interest rate, but you also in terms of you have less monetary resilience because you're closer to the zero lower bound, so you cannot cut the interest rate so easily. So there is a trade-off uh, on these dimensions. If on the finance dimension, um, if you have some very efficient debt restructuring, so if somebody is hit with a negative shock and it suffers from debt overhang problems, if you can restructure the debt easily, you have more resilience, you bounce back. Uh, you can also have higher capital buffers, which also is more a robustness approach. In the international finance area, you can have some flexible exchange rate if there, you know, if the country doesn't have too much of a dollar debt or foreign denominated debt. So combined with the right macro potential policy, then there is more resilience in the system as well. Alternative approach is to have more foreign exchange buffers, but there's a resilience barrier. So it's a robustness barrier uh, because once the buffers, the reserves are used up, they are gone. Essentially, it's hard to build them up. If you think about the blockchains, distributed ledger technologies, there's a lot of resilience built in because essentially the ledger is kept on every uh, computer and every miner 
uh, global value chains, uh, there's a discussion where we have to move away from just in time, much more to just in case. And the big question is, will there be reshoring back to the advanced economies or will there be uh, multi-shoring where you, instead of having outsourced the production to a particular country, uh, you outsource it to three different continents. So if one continent suffers a health a pandemic, uh, you can actually still source from another country. And how do you manage all the supply shortages and uh, through shipping and have more resilience on that, some redundancies on that. And in terms of climate change, as I mentioned before, is very much, you know, avoiding the tipping points. And I also introduce the connection between sustainability and resilience. Sustainability uh, requires resilience. So if a system or society is not resilient, it is also not sustainable because once you're hit by a shock, you're essentially wiped out. But the sustainability requires more than resilience. It also requires that there's no adverse trend. So you can have a very low risk adverse trend, and, but then essentially it still goes down the train. So you still need uh, resilience and you need on top of it, you need no adverse trends. Both combined give you then sustainability. That's a link between the resilience concept and sustainability concept. Now let me, my ult, uh, penultimate slide, let me make a personal conjecture uh, to say something about, you know, auto, autocratic societies and open and democratic societies. And I think one way you can distinguish the two ways of running your society is that the autocratic society seeks more robustness. It's all about it's very attractive immediately in the crisis. There's, you know, you can enforce the rules very powerful because you can suppress individual <laughs> behavior. You can minimize movements and disruptions. And this way you uh, have a very quick response. You can minimize the shock. But it also means whenever there's another crisis, the system is becoming much more um, suppressed over time because with each crisis, more and more layers of suppression essentially are added to the society. And it's, it's very tight and becomes more rigid over time. It doesn't bound back. On the other hand, if you have an open democratic society, it's more resilient. It might appear more wobbly, like the reed compared to the oak at the short horizon. But then it comes up uh, with some new innovations and new ways of arranging things, the information flow, the transparency is much higher from the lower levels to higher levels and new inventions like the vaccine, like uh, universally accepted vaccines, which were invented, they are, might allow us to bounce back. And in the long run, it is a more resilient society compared to some which is very much focused on robustness. So let me conclude with the final slide, just saying what the book, how the book is structured. So the, the first part very much talks about resilience concepts and then how it is, um, the, in fact, impact the, the social contract ideally, so society and resilience. The second part talks about four elements, how to manage an economy and a society in a resilient manner, uh, using COVID as the primary example. And then the third part talks about macroeconomic resilience, goes from innovation effects to versus scarring effects or so the long run implications. It talks about financial stability. The whip saw that you know, in March 2020 it collapsed and then it came back very strongly because of central bank interventions and fiscal interventions. It talks about public debt and inflation whip saw where first of deflationary pressures in March 2020 going on and now we have inflationary pressures. And then finally it goes to the global economy, to emerging market, developing economies, geopolitics, the world order, and how we would like to arrange the global finance and value chains more generally. So that should give a quick overview of what's going on in the book. And uh, we're very grateful and very looking forward to Chilean's and Greg's comments. Again, thanks a lot for doing it. And thanks to Peterson Institute and for, to Adam for inviting me to launch the book with you. Oh, thank you, Marcus. It's been a great learning experience for us working with you on this book. Um, the Resilient Society is available online from Amazon, from everywhere, and uh, you have the links via Princeton PIE as well. Let me turn it over to Jillian Tett and just remind people that uh, registered guests may pose questions using the Q&A function, which will be given to the full panel 
after their remarks. Gillian, please. Well, thank you very much indeed. And I should start by saying how delighted I am to have a chance to chat with Mark or to comment on Marcus Brunemeyer's wonderful book because I've been a fan of his for many, many years. I think we first started talking a lot during the 2008 financial crisis and I've always appreciated your insights and it truly is a terrific book, which I recommend to everyone. And I'm particularly pleased to have a chance to chat because in many ways, the themes that Marcus has been talking about touch on some of the points that I raise in my own book that I published over the summer, Anthrovision, which talks about the fact that I'm trained as a cultural anthropologist. I did a PhD in that in Cambridge many years ago. Um, most people who I speak to in the world of finance and economics think of anthropology as being hopelessly hippy-dippy and weird, a bit like the sort of Indiana Jones of the academic world going to exotic places. And essentially what I argue in my book is that anthropology can be incredibly useful for making sense of the modern world, particularly when combined with disciplines like economics and finance and medicine and law. And in many ways, one of the reasons I said, please have a chance to talk about Marx's book is because I think there's a very interesting shifting of the intellectual tectonic plates going on, which may not be reflected inside university departments, but certainly is captured by the spirit of what you're writing about and to a degree by what I wrote about as well. And the issue is this, when I was at Cambridge University all those years ago, the type of discipline that Marcus comes from um, really represented something that anthropologists and most social scientists who were not economists used to resent. Um, there was a wonderful um, paper that came out many years ago from an economist called Axel Lehnhufert um, looking at the economics profession as if it was a tribe of Inuit um, Eskimos in the frozen north. It's called Life Amongst the Econ. If anyone's an economist and has not read it, I strongly recommend you do because it talks about the tribal patterns of economists, their obsession with mathematical models, their tendency to regard humans as basically atoms that were completely unchanging and could be put into something akin to a physics experiment um, subject to Newtonian laws and the, making the point that much of that process, that vision, simply doesn't match up to the real world. So anthropologists have spent years chuckling about that um, and often sort of making that wonderful joke by Richard Feynman, which is that, you know, you couldn't do physics if the atoms could talk to each other. Um, you can't do financial physics or use macroeconomic models to look at what's happening in the world if you assume that human beings are completely constant and don't change as a result of their interaction with each other. And anthropologists like arguing that point because much of what they do, much of their contribution is to try and look at the complexity and the changing nature of human cultural patterns and how that has a habit of upturning the best made plans and models and frameworks. Now, what I find fascinating about your book, Marcus, and it, I really should salute you by your work you did after the 2008 financial crisis, where you very much took the economic profession by the horns and tried to, if you like, remake it in a much more sophisticated way to make sense of what had happened with the financial crisis. But your book really touches on three themes or it captures three themes, which I think are very dear to anthropologists. One is the fact that um, human beings do interact. Um, as you say, they have a nasty habit of all interacting with each other and trying to build any kind of resilient society needs to take account of the way that human beings interact. They're not just um, static atoms in a physics experiment. They can talk to each other and learn and change. And that's very, very important indeed. The second point I find fascinating is your recognition that the paradigm that shapes any society at any one point of time, you know, is not universal, fixed, unchanging. It's a function of context. We're all creatures of our own environment. Um, econ economists, as Axel Linhoved pointed out, are creatures of their own intellectual environment, their tribal too. So are anthropologists, so are journalists, so are the type of people who are espousing liberal democratic values today in the West that we take for granted as being self-evidently good and universal, and yet a short reading of history shows they're not. And as you point out, as we think about resilience, as we think about the ability of society to rebound, um, we have different models out there in the world today in terms of how to do that, whether you're looking at a more authoritarian or democratic system. And we need to recognize that paradigms shift, 
and that the way we imagine the world and the truth we take for granted in terms of how we structure the world are not fixed in stone, they're not universal, they do change and they need to be re reflected on. And that's very much one of the key themes of my own book, which I think you very much highlight. But the last point, and this really is the biggest point, which I think cuts to the core of the issue of resilience, um, is this question of tunnel vision versus lateral vision. Um, one of the things I argue strongly in my book is that the late 20th century was really marked by a number of intellectual tools that became popular, which were very much tunnel vision tools. Um, you know, macroeconomic models were one of those where basically you looked at the things that were inputted into the model and everything else was an externality. Um, corporate balance sheets are another. Um, everything that's kind of not deemed important is a footnote if you're lucky. Um, and obviously big data sets are another area where you're essentially drawing boundaries around what you're looking at. And that approach is fine if the world is static, knowable and consistent. It's clearly not if the context and environment is changing. If issues like the environment, climate change are becoming increasingly important and changing the way that economies work, it's not enough to treat them as an externality or a footnote to the balance sheet. In some ways, they, they are the model. And anthropology is kind of obsessed with looking at context always to everything, cultural context, the wider ecosystem context, Anthropology really tries to take a joined up view of life, a very holistic vision. Um, that in many ways is what the world of sustainability and ESG is all about as well now. ESG is really lateral vision by another name or sustainability is lateral vision by another name. It's trying to look beyond the box, beyond the boundaries. It's trying to look at externalities and take them seriously and work out how you see what's hidden in plain sight, how you see what's coming around the corner with that wider lateral vision. Um, I think that's absolutely what you're doing, Marcus, with your call for a way of looking at resilience, um, trying to recognize how the world changes, trying to recognize how human beings with all their tribal proclivities and cult weird cultural patterns could and should adapt to the stresses that we're now facing in the world. And you're doing all that within an economic framework as well. So for that, I salute you. It's a long winded way of saying that I do think that the great war that separated so many branches of social sciences in the 20th century is actually in some ways coming full circle. The future will be one where we manage to put data science, economic science um, alongside social science and hopefully pull that together to build a much more resilient society and a, an academic um, fellowship, if you like, that can actually put forward ideas that respond to the crises and work out how to navigate them going forward. So thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Uh, having already done the introductions, let me now turn to Greg. Thanks, Adam, and thanks, Marcus. And may I say it's a privilege to be invited to uh, discuss this book. Uh, the Peterson Institute, of course, has just been a tremendous um, petri dish of great thinking and ideas. And so I'm always pleased to uh, participate in their events. And Marcus is a person whose work I followed for many years and often cited. And, uh, let me just give a shout out to the Marcus Academy, which I think is just one of the most terrific platforms for surfacing salient ideas in ongoing economic discussions. And it's no surprise that the book that Marcus has written, The Resilient Society, is incredibly ambitious. He takes on virtually every big issue currently facing economic uh, policy from COVID, supply chain disruptions, to monetary and fiscal policy, and inequality and globalization. In my remarks today, though, I really want to focus on the core theme of the book, which is the critical role of resilience to society. Uh, central to this is what Marcus contrasts as the uh, competing ideas of resilient and robust. Robust basically means you're impervious to shocks. You're hit by something, but you don't bend. You, you are immovable. You're static. Resilient means you do bend and respond to shocks, but then you rebound back to where you were before. The, you know, um, Signal K example is the mighty oak versus the reed, as uh, Marcus discussed. And I think that most of us in many walks of life intuitively understand this. Anybody who's a parent understands the distinction between robust and resilient child children. So you might make your children robust by protecting them from all adversity. Never let them uh, um, uh, be uh, receive an infection. Never let them sustain an injury while playing. Uh, 
never let their hearts be broken by being exposed to emotional distress. But I think most parents recognize that it's better to make your children resilient, to allow them to pick up small viruses so that their immune system develops, to let them scrape their knees from time to time so they understand how to play safely, and to understand that their hearts will be broken sometimes, but that their hearts will heal and they will learn to love again. In Marcus's thinking, he uses this framework to diagnose and prescribe responses across several dimensions, the financial system, economic growth, COVID, monetary and fiscal policy, and this is really essential work and analysis. And I agree with a lot of it. And uh, sorry, but when you invite one book author to comment on another book, you are inevitably, that author is inevitably going to find an excuse to test their own book, and I am no different. So I would like to discuss Real Digital Society by drawing on a few ideas that I lay out in my own book, Foolproof, which came out six years ago. Shocks, shocks are inevitable. As Marcus writes, for all that humanity has achieved and will achieve in the future, we will unavoidably face numerous shocks. Some shocks can be predicted and understood in advance. Others will be unknown unknowns. And because we cannot avoid shocks as the world evolves, it is crucial for societies to be resilient, to be able to bounce back. Marcus makes some broad observations uh, in this regard. Resilience isn't about risk avoidance, it's about risk management. The problem with risk man avoidance, as Marcus says, is that it could discourage intrinsically risky activities that might yield great societal economic benefits. In fact, a society should desire such risk taking. I agree wholeheartedly this, with this, the point that I made over and over again in my book, and I would just like to share two very brief slides to underline this point. Um, so, let's see. This is a slide from Marcus's presentation, and it very, it's a nice sort of stylized example of the difference between a riskless path and a risky but resilient path. And anybody who's followed business cycles recognizes that solid line. These are recessions, these are expansions. And by allowing people to take risks that result in recessions sometimes, you achieve a higher long-term path of growth than if you never took any risks. Now, as it happens, I can actually, in my book, I actually discuss a real world example of this. So here you will see the contrasting growth paths of two countries, Thailand and India. Thailand is a country that in the 80s and the, the 1980s decided to liberalize its economy by allowing uh, much broader um, access to finance, much more activities for the financial system, much more openness to foreign investment and uh, portfolio flows. Thailand's economy boomed as a result, but in 1998, as most people who are affiliated with the Peterson Institute knows, this resulted in a cataclysmic crisis that then spread to all of East Asia and a significant contraction in GDP. India followed a very different path. India has generally had a very repressive, repressed financial system and significant barriers to foreign investment and so forth. It's a highly regulated economy. And so it did not experience the same crisis that affected Asia. But as you can see from these charts, even though um, Thailand had that severe uh, crisis and recession, it still ended up achieving a higher growth in per capita income than India did. This is because the growth that that risk taking that also, the risk taking that produced a crisis also achieved higher levels of output and investment. And I think that sort of signifies the point that Marcus is making here is that you have to accept some risk of recession and crisis and hardship to achieve higher sustained growth. Our mission is not to eliminate those crises or those recessions, to make them manageable so that the underlying economy bounces back afterwards. Okay, I promise that will be the last uh, slideshow for me, the last, last reference, explicit reference to my book. Um, so risk management, as Marcus writes, is means accepting risk in a framework of institutions, rules, and processes that ensure resilience, which would, if successful, foster risk taking while protecting society if dangers materialize. Now, Marcus notes that not everybody or everything can be resilient. Some shocks are so bad that you just can't recover from them. Some people who get COVID uh, recover fully and they're immune uh, going uh, forward. Some people, unfortunately, will die. Markets are usually self-equilibrating, but we know that they can also be subject to self-fulfilling spirals, information cascades, and fire sales, and these result in cataclysmic crises. But in general, as Marcus writes, enduring a small crisis from time to time is preferable to avoiding them at any cost. A crisis is an opportunity to make needed adjustments. I agree 100%, and there are many great examples of this. As Marcus says, the human immune system is a, a fantastic example. 
exposure to pathogens trains the immune system. There is evidence that exposure to the Russian flu in the late 1800s may be why some people were more immune to the Spanish flu in 1918, 1919. Hong Kong, South Korea, Taiwan, their exposure to SARS in the early 2000s made them quicker to adapt masking and other social distancing protocols in response to COVID and made them more resilient. Preparation for Y2K enabled us to bounce back from 9-11 and the experience of 9-11 enabled us to bounce back from Superstorm super Sandy in 2012 and from COVID. All of this is summed up in the oldest saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. What about COVID? So here though, the risk of writing a book when the pandemic isn't over is that you don't actually fully know what the final lessons are. The traditional resilient response to a, co to a virus, to a, to a um, pandemic is herd immunity. Virus comes along, some people die, the rest develop immunity, society survives. We develop vaccines to hasten the acquisition of herd immunity. But what do you do when the vaccine isn't available or isn't very effective? Well, there are two approaches. The robust approach is suppression of the virus, also known as zero COVID. And this is a strategy pursued by New Zealand and China. And so far, it has maximized, uh, the, um, it has minimized death without notably worse, arguably better, uh, without notably worse economic outcomes. The resilient approach would be what, for example, what Florida and Sweden have approached. Basically, let people adapt, minimize disruptions, minimize um, restrictions, let people find their comfort level with the virus. And in fact, we know that behavioral adaptation leads to, um, that, is, that leads to a fault. We know that, uh, that in previous cycles of the virus, a lot of the reduction in the reproductive number is because of spontaneous adaptive behavior by people trying to avoid infection, not by government mandates. And so far, this approach has resulted in more deaths and not obviously better economic performance, but it's very early to say which approach is actually better. We don't know ultimately whether, for example, China can stick with its zero COVID strategy. Each new variant seems to be more transmissible than the last and makes the suppression robust strategy more costly. What about the economic response to COVID? Marcus emphasizes the importance of diversification and redundancy. You develop multiple vaccines, not just one, but redundancy matters in other ways. For example, when the Twin Towers were destroyed in 9-11, telephone service in Manhattan was completely knocked out. But by the time Superstorm Sandy came along, everyone had cell phones. And if you were able to find backup power, you were able to communicate even though the switching stations had all been flooded. So redundancy is one way of being resilient to shocks. With COVID, the fact that we by this point had developed ubiquitous broadband internet enabled us to recreate much of our economic lives online through remote work, e-commerce, online education, and telemedicine. And this is a powerful source of resilience that will, I think, also hold up well in future disasters. Now let's turn very briefly to monitoring fiscal policy. Marcus argues that central bank uh, are crucial to resilience. They act as lender of last resort to prevent financial disruptions from becoming systemic failures. This is because of their ability to create from thin air the final means of settlement of any claim. Which nobody else can, uh, uh, which nobody else can do. They can basically, when everybody wants cash, only the central bank can create more. Monetary policy provides another essential function. They erect guardrails around both inflation and unemployment, so that while they cannot eliminate uh, high inflation or high unemployment, they can limit its am um, its amplitude. And therefore, monetary policy keeps growth within that upper channel that Marcus has identified. We do have recessions, we do have booms, but we avoid depressions and we avoid hyperinflations. In other words, as Marcus puts it, they systematically remove tail risks. However, in the current context, we have seen that the power of monetary policy to provide resilience has been compromised because of secular forces that have kept the level of real interest rates low around the world. And that means in a world of low inflation, you also have very low nominal rates and you have thus less room to respond to economic shocks. This might call for a new framework such as price level targeting, average inflation targeting, or higher inflation target, all of which would raise trend inflation and nominal rates and provide uh, monetary policy with more ability to respond to shocks and therefore make the economy more resilient. But there's an overarching problem here, which I talk about at length in my book, and that's the Minsky hypothesis, the Hyman-Minsky hypothesis, which is that stability is destabilizing. The Fed's skill, in, in my book, I argue that the Fed's skill over 25 year period responding to crises, inflation, and unemployment produced um, a secular rise in debt, a decline in um, uh, prophylactic liquidity, 
and a boom in financial innovation, such as maturity transformation, all of it premised on the notion that liquidity would always be available, that small, that large deep recessions were a thing of the past, and that you, for example, would never have a very large decline in housing prices. And of course, it was exactly those assumptions that led to the risk taking that therefore made the global financial crisis possible, um, driven by a collapse in housing prices and a knock on um, disappearance of liquidity and contagion. As Marcus says, monetary policy by removing tail risks ca may cause moral hazard. But this is not literally moral hazard insofar as participants aren't responding to these trends by expecting to be bailed out of those losing positions. They simply don't expect losing positions to be large or frequent. And thus they're willing to take bigger risks. And as Marcus has notes, we want people to take risks. And I would argue that it was the great um, uh, moderation that enabled things like the tech media telecom bubble in the early 2000s. When that bubble burst, it cost a lot of people a lot of money and it caused minor recession, but it gave us things like Amazon and Amazon Web Services and all this broadband internet and all those innovations contributed to the resilience that we experience today in response to COVID. Very quickly, fiscal policy. Marcus says the role of fiscal policy is add resilience to the economy. I couldn't agree more. But then the risk becomes, what if you go too far? What if every time you respond to a recession, you crank up the fiscal stimulus and you jack up the debt to GDP ratio? Our debt to GDP ratio has since 2008 gone from 30% to 100% of GDP because of the fiscal response to the very, very large shocks. This has not produced a large decline, a large rise in the debt servicing burden because it has occurred against a secular decline in real interest rates. But I would predict that real interest rates aren't going to decline a much lot further in the future because they're around zero right now. And this raises questions about whether this source of resilience will be there in the future. As Marcus writes, um, resilience means having extra spending capacity in bad times, which requires the buildup for redundancies in good times. Uh, so I'll leave, uh, I'll leave it at that and happy to uh, join in the larger discussion now. Thank you very much, Greg. Marcus, we're not doing this academic style. So unless you feel that there's some major injustice done you by Jillian or Greg, I'm gonna to turn to the questions from the audience now. Um, first up, coming off of some of Greg's remarks uh, about risk-taking, we have a question, let's see, where is it? Sorry. Um, Dana Supporta says, Greg, I find it interesting you highlight subdued risk-taking under a robust system versus helpful risk-taking under a resilient system. Aren't there scenarios in which a very robust system encourages greater than desired risk-taking in an economy? I know that all three of you have thought about this issue, but maybe Marcus, you wanna spell out how your book sees this issue of excess risk-taking? Yeah, so I think it's, it's very important that people can take risk and then they can also fail and bounce back. So you allow them some risk-taking, like you, know, you have some startups and you can fail and become, become a bigger startup later on. And um, I think what's really important is to have some sense what type of risk you're taking. If you take some risk, which might be spiraling out of control because you hit a tipping point or there's no resilience because you're trapped afterwards. So rather than measuring you know, how risky is a situation, you should measure how likely is it that you can bounce back by changing things. So if people are more agile, if the system is more flexible to respond, you can take more risk. So we, in order to prepare for this risk and be able to take this risk, you have a more flexible uh, environment. So I agree very much with what Craig and Jillian, what, what they said. Uh, and you have to be exposed to risk in order to know how to, to deal with it and how to bounce back uh, from risk. I would not agree that, you know, I would follow the Swedish model in a sense. I think I'm very much in the idea of, you know, we develop new vaccines and bounce back. So the problem with the zero COVID or no COVID strategy was essentially there was no new normal where you could bounce back to. And I think having this um, strategy of developing new vaccines, that will boost our medical advancement dramatically in terms of cancer, malaria, and other uh, diseases we were not really being able to address fully so far. And there's some positive side effects from this coming as well. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, Jillian or Greg, anything you want to add? I know Greg has addressed this in his previous remarks. Yeah. I'll just simply make the very obvious point that countries or communities' ability to embrace risk-taking is fundamentally rooted in culture. 
Um, and that is also rooted in their concepts about time horizons, um, about whether they see time as a sort of straight, consistent thing, or whether they see it as a circle, whether they feel they have, you know, community support, their sense of individual agency, et cetera, et cetera. And these can change over time. I mean, during the 2008 financial crisis, as anyone who lived through it knows, everyone's time horizon sort of just completely collapsed dramatically. Um, during COVID-19, our time horizons have changed again. Um, so I think, again, you know, I salute this point about risk taking, um, you know, for what, a, what, what it's worth, I think trying to find mechanisms, as Marcus says, to encourage positive risk taking um, rather than shying away from it is going to be absolutely critical for building resilience in almost every possible societal level. Um, but you need to recognize that there's actually a cultural aspect to it, too. Yeah, I'd like to just yeah touch on two very examples actually from the environment the environment that I think make the uh, commenters point very well about the risks of robust systems. So let's think about flood control. Um, the, for a thousand years, the usual response to flood control has been to build levees and dikes. And so, for example, roughly half of the Netherlands is built on land that's reclaimed from the ocean and is built behind dikes that are meant to withstand ten thousand year floods. The Dutch have a saying that there are only two types of levee: those that have not failed, those that have failed, and those that will fail. So there will always be uh, come along some risk that overwhelms whatever defenses you build. We saw that with Katrina back in 2006, of course, where the levees ultimately failed. And the problem with reliance on a robust defense system like levees is that it creates what the Corps of Engineers would call the levee mentality. You think you're safe. And so it encourages development behind the levees. And it means that you basically um, <laughs> you increase by orders of magnitude the destruction that occurs when the levees fail. And so a resilient approach would be to basically what the Dutch now uh, base call room for the river. You essentially build cities uh, further away from floodplains and you do simple things like in the case of New York City after Superstorm Sandy, you take the electrical and switching systems out of the basement, you put them on the second floor so that if you have more floods, the entire building doesn't shut down. Uh, wildfire control is another one. One of the reasons I mean that climate change is resulting, that one reason that the warmer climate is resulting in so much such worse wildfires is that for a century, the Forest Service relied, uh, relied on suppressing almost every fire. And the reason they did that was because we kept building homes in the wild land, uh, the uh, urban wild uh, land interface, and it was necessary to suppress fire to save lives. What happened, we have discussed, studies have shown that when you increase fire suppression, you actually encourage development, putting more homes at risk. What is one solution to this? Well, one solution would be to not allow people to build so close to the, uh, uh, to, to, um, uh, to brush areas. So in Australia, for example, homes must now be built with a defensible perimeter so that when fire threatens, embers cannot cross that perimeter and land on the roof of the house and set fire. So uh, this is another way of saying that if you assume that robust solutions are only built to a certain point of failure. So for example, levees are only built to a height and once you reach the, the, the water, floodwaters top that height, they will fail. That's what worries me a little bit about this appeal of geoengineering as a solution to climate change. What happens when the geoengineering solution fails? Suddenly the climate tips very rapidly to a very high concentration of, of excess heat. Thank you, Greg. Um, Continuing, because we want to get in as many questions as possible. Marcus, picking up on the climate examples, uh, Peter Heijman says, uh, climate change is not a sudden shock, but something that started years ago. Does climate change fit in your framework? Does this require a different kind of resilience? And I would relate to that a question from Heinrich Peispens. How would you discuss resilience versus sustainability? Is it just trend versus cycle? Sharp disasters versus ongoing? Could you say a little more about how you think about these longer term issues that may not be short, sharp shocks? Yes, so this is a very interesting point. I touch on this uh, on the climate chapter in the book. Essentially, sustainability means that you are resilient and on top of it, you don't have a negative trend. So and in the climate example, you might have not so many shocks initially, but you might have a downward trend and that makes things duration worse and worse slowly over time. And that's you know, what we experienced in the last few decades. And then the shocks might only come later on temporarily, then you have a hard, sharp shock as well. And then you might be less resilient. So there are two ways uh, you can see that. So one is just a negative trend that you, the mean essentially is dropping down or the average is going down, is getting worse and worse. 
or you have more frequent shocks. So the frequency of the shocks is going up. And on top of it, the shocks become less and less resilient to manage. So it's much harder to bounce back from these shocks. And the tipping points are very dramatic examples of that. I mentioned the Gulf Stream, but there are many other examples which come up where essentially uh, once you hit a certain tipping point, uh, then the whole situation spirals out of control. And as, as Greg mentioned, you know, we have one approach, which is a more critical approach and people are very afraid of it is geoengineering. And uh, geoengineering is one way to deal with it, but there's a lot of uncertainty involved. And if you don't know how this gene engineering, whether it works or not, uh, then you might actually suddenly spiral much harder out of control. And there's of course also a geopolitical order. So it's the, who can do this geoengineering. Let's suppose if there's a small country uh, which is threatened by higher sea levels and decides on its own to do geoengineering for the whole globe. What is the global arrangement we have in order to control uh, that? It, does the United Nations have to vote that we together do geoengineering if uh, some country wants to do it? Uh, because they are threatened. How can we block a country from doing it? So there are a lot of interesting issues which we need at a, a global society level. We need some uh, governance structure to address these issues. And uh, I, I don't see it yet that these issues are debated uh, at the full level, uh, which we have to debate it in order to have this resilient global society. Thank you, Marcus. And obviously, as the Peterson Institute for International Economics, we're trying to work on that aspect of the issue as well. You may have seen the recent publication by our colleague, John Pisani Ferry on the macro aspects of this. Yeah. Um, let me gather a few questions for the whole panel on this sort of political economy governance side, if I could. Julia von Borstos asks, are we sure about the conclusion regarding democratic versus autocratic success? China invented vaccines as well. What if within the Chinese population, only a smaller part opposes more pressure being put on each new crisis? Do we have clear indications really that democratic societies are more resilient? And also Mark Castle raises what I think is a related question. The book assumes crises occur, but how does the book or how do the three panelists weigh in on the idea of who defines a crisis? What's the process for deciding when we're in a crisis, when we act? Who decides the crisis is over? Um, and then finally, we've got on this topic, um, well, let me leave it there. I'm sorry. I will try not to concatenate too much. So maybe we start with Jillian, then Greg, then Marcus on this idea of who defines the crisis and how that would work in governance terms and democracies versus non-democracies. Well, to be cynical, um, a crisis is defined when the leaders recognize that something nasty is happening that could affect them as well. It's amazing how leaders or people who are running countries or companies or anything else have the ability to ignore enormous amounts of pain if it's only affecting poor, irrelevant people as opposed to lapping at their own jaws. Um, and, you know, one of the things I also argue in my book is that, you know, it's a profound tragedy that because um, Western governments spent so many years sort of shutting their eyes or ignoring weird people on the other side of the world, be that the people who suffered from Ebola in 2014 in West Africa, in places that Donald Trump called shitholes, or be that um, the what was happening in Wuhan um, at quite an early stage, much of that went ignored on the assumption that it would never come back and rebound and um, affect the West. Um, we paid the price for it and we both failed to understand the risks and learn some really important lessons for how to manage epidemics early on. Um, anyway, in terms of the question of how you define crises, um, in many ways, you can't ever say this is the beginning or the end of a crisis. But what governments could and should do is try to find ways to frame the narrative for their populations, both in terms of providing a level of comfort and explanation and going forward. Um, there are ways to do this. Um, I suggest that the concept of liminality is one phrase or concept that could have been very usefully used um, during the lockdown to explain that this was a kind of transition moment. It wasn't a permanent state of being. Um, but I think going forward, exactly what Marx is doing in terms of trying to lay out these ideas about resilience, recovery, rebound, robustness, um, is exactly the kind of language that people should be talking about. And building back better won't mean just going back to where we were before. It means actively thinking about the fact that new shocks will almost certainly come on a regular basis. Um, back during 2008, um, one of the sort of titans of the central bank world joked to me that what they really wanted to see as a central banker 
was a Goldilocks crisis, something that happened um, every so often, which was just big enough to shake everyone up, but not too big to bring the whole system crashing down. Um, you need to keep that sense of awareness and readiness about what's coming down the tracks. And that awareness and knowledge um, is very much you know, what needs to be in place going forward. Um, on the issue of democracy versus authoritarianism, um, I'll leave that to Greg. I'll simply say that although every society assumes that the environment it lives in is natural, normal and permanent, and every, every time that is wrong, you know, a fish can't see water unless it jumps out of its own fishbowl. And the ideas that have been taken for granted in the last 20 or 30 years in the West about how to run societies are clearly now being challenged by a different model from China um, in terms of what, how to bring effective 21st century economies forward, but with a different political mentality. Okay, Greg? You know, the democracy versus authoritarianism one is that I think a lot of people, including me, have wrestled with for a very long time. I think my prejudice when I start out is that democracies are more resilient because since no um, nobody is born with an innate uh, knowledge of what the perfect way to run a country is, it's necessary for societies to self-correct by occasionally throwing out the people who are in charge and putting new people in charge to try something new. Um, and so, for example, if I were to, have, if you had asked me five years ago whose system would um, uh, survive better, America's or China's, I would have said America's hands, hands down. But I think like a lot of people, the last years have made me sort of question my priors. Uh, if you just look at three events in the way China and the United States have responded to them, one, uh, for example, uh, the uh, COVID, I mean, the uh, America's excess of democracy, if you will, has made it almost impossible to consistently apply a coherent set of protocols for social distancing, vaccination, et cetera. And therefore we've had both uh, terrible economic outcomes and terrible health outcomes uh, relative to China. Um, the global financial crisis, which certainly didn't speak well to the capitalist model that the United States has tended to uh, preach for the last uh, few decades. And finally, January 6th, the assault on the Capitol. And as a result, um, you know, this great democracy of ours is one that uh, President Trump and a large portion of his followers have more or less argued uh, was corrupted and they have refused to accept the outcome. So I sit here, one, you know, and you contrast that with the communist leadership, which has by and large made the right, the big, gotten the big calls right for the last two or three decades. And so if, you know, <laughs> If you're a Bayesian like me and you basically update your priors, you'd sort of like update your priors and say, well, maybe democracy isn't the most resilient system. And you worry that our democracy is reaching one of those tipping points uh, that Marcus writes about in his book, where instead of bouncing back, it is falling into a downward spiral. Before I get too dark about my assumptions on that, though, I do remember that there have been many people who felt that way with the United States in the past. I mean, as James Fallows once wrote, you know, um, uh, uh, John Adams, uh, Thomas Jefferson thought the world was going to hell when John Adams was president. And John Adams definitely thought the world was going to hell when Thomas Jefferson was president. And so um, the United States has, the United States is a young country, but it's a very old regime. We've had more or less the same democratic system for over 200 years, whereas the communist regime is actually relatively young. And the first half of it from 1949 to 1978 was extremely brittle and repeatedly uh, face existential crises brought on by deep errors by its leadership. What are the odds that a essentially an autocracy will continue to get all the big calls right for the next 20 or 30 years, cut off from the feedback mechanism that democracy provides? So I guess um, I think that it, if push comes to shove, I would still say democracies are more resilient. Thank you. Uh, there are a number of great questions that I want to get to, but we are running out of time. So Marcus, if you could have your last word, please. I just would like to thank you, Chilean and Greg, for a great discussion and come back to this democracy versus uh, autocracy. And I, I very much agree with Greg what, uh, what he said. If you make big calls, you can coordinate much better in an autocracy but you can also make big mistakes because it's coordinated mistakes. In an open society, you have many more voices being heard. You might have some mavericks coming up with some new ideas. There's suddenly you know, a little biotech company in Germany developing some new vaccine and so forth. And that's actually something which in open society we will go much better than in, in, in an autocratic society. I just want to touch the other question about what defines a crisis. 
I think there doesn't need to be an official definition. Uh, typically, what's a crisis is, as long as you try to preserve the whole thing, it's typically not referred to as a crisis. Once you decide, okay, you give up something, you throw certain things overboard in order to protect the core, I would call this then a crisis phenomenon. And, but, you know, that the open society can actually then decide you know, some people find we're already in a crisis, others are not, and react accordingly. Uh, and that's uh, this is an advantage as well, because they make different decisions and there might be one bulletproof, which might one aspect which helps us to get out of the crisis. Thank you, Marcus. Thanks to Jillian Tett and Greg Ip, who were not only apt, but excellent commentators, uh, bringing the perspectives from out of the box on these issues that they've already published on. But thanks especially to all our audience joining us for the launch of Marcus Bernemeyer's new book, The Resilient Society, Lessons from the Pandemic for Recovering from the Next Major Shock. It is available online. Uh, you can look at it at the Bernheim Center at Princeton at PIIE. And the video of this event and discussion will remain up on the PIE website. And we're grateful to be associated with Marcus and this brilliant insight into the resilient society. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.